thank you so much for uh, staying in the, to the very last end of the session. So I'm Ben Lonai, and uh, I uh, am a patient with um, a disease called X-linked adrenoleukodystrophy, and I'm a uh, co-founder of the uh, leading international patient-powered research network, or uh, PPRN, for this disease, which is called ALD Connect. So once upon a time, I was a perfectly normal, uh, outdoorsy, athletic Silicon Valley guy until my first symptoms appeared in about 2006, and I was formally diagnosed in 2011. Uh, so today, I still feel the same. I feel like a, an outdoorsy, athletic guy, but I have to walk with a cane. Uh, that's me here in Palo Alto with my dog, my golden retriever, and uh, she's very patient with me. Uh, walking very slowly, and uh, I also have a, uh, a sword above my head in the form of uh, constant concern. That's a, a picture of me here uh, with a sword above my head and uh, beautiful creatures playing the harp for me. Uh, that's my life. Um, so what is XALD? Uh, if you bear with me, I'll spend a few seconds on the, uh, the disease. Um, so basically, XALD is a, uh, it's a rare uh, neurometabolic disease. I inherited from my mom a gene mutation that makes it impossible for me to metabolize certain types of fats. And this, in turn, leads to a cascade of neurological problems. Um, so uh, about 1 in 16,000 males in the US uh, is affected. Uh, for our disease, uh, it's a mutation in the ABCD1 gene, which makes it impossible to metabolize very long-chain fatty acids through the peroxisome. So most foods are metabolized in the mitochondria. Uh, very long-chain fatty acids are metabolized in the peroxisome, and uh, we, our bodies cannot uh, metabolize them. And so that leads to a, a toxic accumulation of these very long-chain fatty acids in the body. And in turn, they cause damage to, um, uh, to uh, the myelin sheath, to uh, the adrenal cortex, to axons. Um, the um, very long chain fatty acids are in foods, in things like tuna and salmon. Uh, but they're also uh, made by the body through a, a process of elongation of shorter chain fatty acids. So I can't really control my disease through diet. Um, the movie got its 15 minutes, or the disease got its 15 minutes of fame with a 1992 movie called Lorenzo's Oil uh, with Peter Ustinov, Nick Nolte, and Susan Sarandon. I think most of you are too young to remember these names. And it, the movie told the true story of a, a little boy, Lorenzo Odone, uh, who was affected by the disease. And his father, Augusto Odone, uh, was not a medical man, but uh, came up with an engineered vegetable oil to try to normalize levels of very long chain fatty acids in the boy's body. And what's interesting and somewhat tragic is you look at this movie, came out in 1992, and at the end of the movie and in the medical community at the time, there was a lot of hope that a cure for this disease was right around the corner. Yet more than 20 years later, a definitive treatment remains very elusive. So one final thing about the disease, all males uh, who have the gene mutation will be affected, will become symptomatic. Uh, yet, for the same genotype, you have two very different phenotypes. Uh, some males will uh, have the disease uh, as boys. Typically, the onset is between ages six and eight. Some males, like me, will uh, start having the disease uh, later in adult life. Uh, for boys, the progression is relentless, very bleak, with cerebral demyelination. Uh, for uh, older men, uh, the progression is much slower. And typically, uh, the first symptoms are below the waist. So walking difficulty, uh, gait, dysfunction, urinary urgency. And, uh, and such symptoms. By the way, the uh, adult uh, phenotype is called adrenomyeloneuropathy, or AMN. So basically, again, two very different phenotypes for the same uh, genotype. 
So today I'll talk a little bit about my journey right before and right after diagnosis, and then a second journey, which in a way has been more challenging and, and uh, interesting, which is uh, joining the front lines uh, of the fight against the disease. Uh, so in, in a way, you know, in terms of relative complexity, when you get diagnosed, it's a little bit like turning 18 and getting the right to vote. So you have to get informed to make I intelligent decisions. But when you uh, become a patient activist, it's like being elected to the US Congress. Uh, things get a lot more complicated. Uh, all XALD patients, um, whether boys or adults, have horror stories about the journey to diagnosis. That's pretty typical of many orphan diseases. I was lucky in that it took me only five years to get diagnosed. Uh, neurologists, for the most part, use methods from the 19th century, from Charcot. Uh, they have a standard test. They go through a process of elimination. They suspect uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, ALS, which has been in the news lately. I, I didn't bring my uh, ice bucket. And then they go to second tier suspects like um, uh, hereditary uh, spastic paraplegia. This was a time in my life when I had a lot of anxiety and torment because I knew that something was very wrong with me. Uh, I knew it was quickly getting worse. Uh, I didn't know if I was foregoing things that could be good for me, if I was doing things that were bad for me, and whether it would kill me. So I was diagnosed in December 2011 uh, by a physician at UCSF. Uh, a character a little bit like the uh, Dr. House character on TV, uh, who took one look at me, ordered a blood test for XALD, and uh, he said, you know, you have to know what to look for. And then uh, subsequently, a uh, genetic test confirmed the diagnosis. So having a diagnosis was both uh, uh, devastating and uh, wonderful uh, for me. Uh, devastating because it kind of pulverized all my uh, dreams of a, um, a happy and active middle age and retirement. I was immensely sad knowing that I wouldn't be able to go anymore to the, uh, the mountains with my sons to go skiing, uh, backpacking, climbing. I wouldn't be able to, uh, to dance and play tennis with my wife. But on the other hand, uh, having a, a name attached to my condition allowed me, empowered me to research it. And so for me, that meant um, understanding the pathways and mechanics of the disease, the different phenotypes, and specifically knowing that I, ha I had, based on my, my profile, I most likely had adrenomyeloneuropathy, the adult version of XALD. And so the disease would not immediately kill me. Um, in a way, I think my approach has been uh, no different than you know, a lot of the other e-patients. Um, I'm a perfectionist. I like doing a good job. I have hobbies and passions. I've invested myself in learning and getting better at things. So I wanted to become good at uh, living with and understanding this disease. I didn't want to fail at having this disease. Uh, part of my research was on uh, genetics. Uh, some family members were tested and counseled. I surveyed the, uh, the landscape of the disease, the prevalence, uh, patient profiles, uh, who are the specialists. Uh, it's interesting to know that many efforts are conducted internationally. So basically, it's a, you, know, you scout for who's out there, what are they working on, uh, will their efforts help me in my lifetime? And then my second journey, uh, starting in 2013 with the foundation of ALD Connect, uh, has been more, more uh, satisfying, but also more humbling. Because as a patient activist, I had to build bridges uh, with a, a bunch of, of different people. Uh, so that meant a lot more than just getting on social networks and sharing knowledge. It meant, meant really building bridges with people who come from totally different backgrounds, uh, we've been sometimes working in the trenches for decades as part of uh, small and fragmented patient advocacy groups. And I realized that there is really a, a rare disease subculture, a rare disease tribe. So in the US, it's funny, you know, you have people going to Burning Man, you have people collecting orchids, 
Uh, you have people going to dog shows, dog talent shows on the weekend, and then you have rare disease people. And so, um, to me, it meant uh, finding a common language with people with sometimes very different dispositions, socioeconomic backgrounds, education levels, and beliefs. It took me a while to realize that we'll, our disease also has two very different constituencies. So one is uh, mothers of affected boys. The other one is uh, adult men. Uh, mothers of affected boys are nursing very sick boys or grieving deceased boys. And so for them, uh, priority is a uh, public policy measure, which is the inclusion of our disease in the newborn screening panel in all 50 states in the US. So this would give us the ability to identify boys who have the genetic mutation and monitor them uh, before the disease starts. And actually, the measure is on uh, Governor Brown's desk uh, for his signature as we speak. Um, men who have the disease, by, by comparison, have led somewhat normal lives, or, or quite normal lives, like, like I did until my early 40s. And um, they want to maintain normal function for as long as possible. And so they crave a connection with other affected men to share practical tips. So to build mutual trust, I've shared my story very honestly and factually uh, with other men with the unvarnished truth about my symptoms, my emotions, and I've connected with men this way. Interestingly, although adult ALD, AMN, is more prevalent than the pediatric cerebral form of the disease, AMN patients are underrepresented in uh, patient groups and social networks. And so we're trying to transform a, an isolating experience into a more empowering one. I also, uh, with the formation of um, ALD Connect, which has five initial academic centers, including Stanford, I, um, I learned to work with our neurologist PIs, uh, including Dr. Keith Van Heren, who is a neurologist uh, at Stanford, who is my close ALD Connect collaborator. And that, melt, that meant uh, building a, an even-handed and unprejudiced relationship uh, with our PIs. Um, I did not put them on pedestals. I had sometimes to uh, rebuff paternalistic attitudes. But I also um, did not question the PI's motivation and character and treated them as professionals at all times. Uh, I think some patients become impatient and angry and see the medical establishment as self-serving and obstructionist. And I think that's uh, a mistaken attitude. I had to find my sweet spot in working with our PIs. I can't outsmart them on medical matters, uh, but I can help connect the dots on their very crowded radar screens. Um, I also um, know from my, my technology background, I know technology, I know marketing, I know finance, I know IP law, I know government affairs. So I'm a person who has skills to contribute to the fight against the disease. I needed to understand the key gaps in the fight against the disease and keep perspective on how they could be plugged. So I was dismayed when I started working with ALD Connect to realize uh, that not only there was very little uh, physician awareness of the disease, but uh, even our PIs uh, were uh, working in silos and uh, strictly within the confines of their centers. And they were ba lacking basic infrastructure, basic plumbing. So we didn't have a nationwide um, uh, patient registry, uh, biomarker database, um, a, uh, any kind of standardized case report forms. We could not do natural history studies. And so uh, we uh, received seed funding from industry. And the government-sponsored organization, PCORI, the Patient Centered Outcomes Research Institute, to build this basic plumbing and uh, to, to plug these gaps. I also had to understand the uh, drug discovery life cycle, because finally for ALD, we have some promising therapies that we're about to bring to uh, clinical trials. So many elements go into uh, investigational new drug, IND application. It's mind-boggling for the layman. 
And uh, so many things go into developing a sound uh, protocol for a clinical study. Randomized, uh, double-blind, uh, placebo-controlled trials are still the gold standard, but they can seem very unfair uh, for a small population of uh, orphan disease. And in general, all clinical trials take too long. Uh, but I finally had to understand trade-offs, which is, for example, that a, a rigorous and, uh, and successful study uh, will likely make approval and reimbursement of the therapy uh, more, more, uh, happen more quickly. We also at ALD Connect uh, mapped uh, funding mechanisms uh, from industry, from donors, from private donors, from foundations, as well as uh, trying to navigate the maze of the uh, National Institute of Health, uh, the NIH, and in particular the uh, National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, NINDS. We're trying to understand all their different grant, grant opportunities can be a surreal experience. Uh, I work to create um, uh, content for fellow patients, uh, starting with a uh, nine-minute whiteboard tutorial to explain the science of the disease, and then also a, uh, a seven, 17 minute exercise video uh, for patients in the uh, mild to moderate stage of the disease. There is a lot of evidence that, uh, in particular, Pilates helps patients with neurodegeneration to maintain their strength, their balance, and their mobility. So we did that, and we're up to about 1,000 views, uh, which is about one-fifth of the adult patient population in the US. So it's, uh, it's been a wonderful success. I also wanted to bring some of Silicon Valley's newest ideas to our team. I'm uh, very excited about private social networking for patients in a, in a walled garden protected from the outside, uh, where patients can uh, dynamically discover one another and then uh, support one another and, and share information and get profiled to get enrolled in clinical trials. Um, but unfortunately, we got a lot of pushback on this uh, with some genuine and, in my view, some misinformed concerns about cost, uh, control, and privacy. Um, in my mind, social networks improve transparency, access to information, uh, a dialogue between patients and institutions, and uh, when the public has a say in setting priorities for ALD Connect and monitoring our activities, you have a lot of good things that come as a result. You have more social capital, more innovation, and uh, obviously more democracy. So in conclusion, I will quote from one of my favorite writers, uh, you probably don't know him, Reynolds Price, uh, who taught at Duke University's entire life. Uh, he was a great Southern writer, and he was diagnosed with a terminal spinal tumor at age 50, and he became a paraplegic uh, until his death 25 years later. And he had wonderful words in a book called A Whole New Life, about surviving a hairpin turn in the midst of life. And so I will read this to you. This is actually a photo of him uh, in his last month of life. He, he actually uh, was a, just a, a wonderful person. He said, don't long for the person you used to be, because you're not that person now. Who will you be tomorrow? Who do you propose to be from here to the grave? which may be hours or decades down the road. Grieve for a decent, decent, limited time over whatever parts of your old self you'll miss. Then find your way to be the next viable you, a whole other clear-eyed person, realistic and thankful for air, not to speak of the human kindness you'll meet everywhere. Your loved ones will be hard at work in the fierce endeavor to revive your old self, the self they recall with love and respect. But they will stall you in your effort to learn who you need to be now and how to be him or her tomorrow. How you manage that huge transformation is your problem and nobody else's. So come back to life, whoever you'll be. Thank you.